Everybody looks like they're ready. They, they got quiet. <laughs> I guess that's because I walked up here. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Good to see everybody for this Wednesday evening. Uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed the rain. Uh, it's a day which the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And uh, so I try to be thankful for every day for God's goodness and his wonderful blessings. And uh, certainly he's been good to me today. And I, I bet everyone here tonight would say that he's been good to you as well. Thank you for coming out and sharing with us. We're going to get underway with our study for the evening and um, take just a few minutes You'll have the first choir practice after the Bible study tonight that you've had in, what, over a year, I guess. And uh, so I hope that you're looking forward to that. And I want to, uh, as I told Brother Larry, I want to give you plenty of time for that. So if you have your Bible with you, I'm going to look at one verse of Scripture, but several other passages. Um, but our... Central verse will be Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, if you'd like to be turning there. Remember those that are on our prayer list always, um, and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes uh, after our study time. <clears throat> but uh, as we pray tonight, let's remember all of the special needs. Pray for our nation. My goodness, how we need prayer and pray for God's church everywhere, not just here at Benham, but everywhere. A great need for prayer in these days that we uh, are dealing with. Let's go together to the Lord. Father, thank you for your blessings upon us today and the wonderful privilege to be a part of the family of God and to be a part of this local family uh, that represents you here at Benham Baptist. We are grateful for how you have provided in our lives this week. We ask that you speak to our hearts tonight. Uh, may your holy word speak to us. Uh, may our hearts be challenged. <clears throat> may it cause us to do further studying. And Lord, through all that is done, I pray that uh, you will be uplifted. I pray, Lord, that you will bless all of the special needs of those that we love and appreciate and that we are remembering. May you meet each of those needs as you see fit in your wonderful way to do so. And uh, we'll give you thanks and praise for all that you do as best we know how. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, we find these words. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. <clears throat> this, of course, is known as Holy Week that we're experiencing now, leading us up to Easter and uh, this past Sunday, being Palm Sunday, I focused on the crucifixion of the Lord. And, of course, that was intended to prepare our hearts to think on what Christ did for us and the great price he paid so that we could enjoy the liberty that we have in him as believers. Um, but there's a question that has uh, been on my mind for most of my Christian life. And I'm going to tell you tonight that I still don't have the full answer after all these years. But I'm going to share something with you. A few things that uh, uh, hopefully will maybe cause you to go in search of more information, more scriptures, and so forth. I want to ask a question, and that question is this. 
And you might say, well, now, boy, I know the answer to that. I know that right off the top of my head. I can tell you the answer. Um, and that's fine if you're that confident. But the question is this, on what day was Jesus crucified? On what day was Jesus crucified? Um, I thought at one time about just taking a poll to see, uh, you know, who said what, but I don't want to put you on the spot <laughs> with regard to that. Um, Peter said on one occasion, as he was talking about the writings of the Apostle Paul, that there were things that Paul had written which were uh, hard to understand, some of those things hard to understand, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And he goes on to say that there are those who are unlearned who want to rest, is the word he uses there in verse uh, 16, uh, meaning to twist uh, out of the correct meaning or to distort what is being said. And he said there are people who do those things about some of the hard things that are, uh, uh, that are not easy to be understood that Paul has written. Well, uh, I would suggest unto us that this is a hard one to understand, and I want to be fair about that and tell you up front that I'm not here to give you uh, a finite answer to that question tonight. I want you to know that up front. I've studied for years and years, all of my life, and I'll give you some things to think about uh, that hopefully will be good. But I, no doubt like you, have over the years uh, heard many discussions about what day of the week Jesus was crucified on. There are folks that believe it's on Wednesday. There are folks that believe it's on Thursday. But the majority believes that it's Friday. But is that, is that true? Which one of those is right? Um, and like I say, uh, we would probably generally um, speaking, answer the question by saying, oh, he was crucified on Friday. That's why we celebrate Good Friday. Um, but let me tell you that that is the date that was set aside hundreds of years ago by the church to be the date recognized uh, as uh, the date of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. But is it the correct day? Is it the correct day? I have read in a previous Sunday school lesson from Lifeway that we had, not since I've been here, but previously, and I actually extracted that and put it in my file so I could go back to it, but uh, back in the winter of 2015-2016, this question was raised in a Sunday school lesson, and it was answered in this way. And I'm going to quote from what that Sunday school lesson said. Three days and three nights was a common idiom by which to refer to three days. In Jewish reckoning, any part of a day would be counted as one day. Hence, Jesus was buried late on Friday, remained in the tomb all of Saturday, and was raised early on Sunday, a sequence that would be described as being in the tomb three days. That's what the author of that Sunday school lesson uh, put in the commentary of that lesson. Merrill F. Unger, who I uh, have a lot of respect for, and you may have Unger's Bible Dictionary in your library at home. Uh, but Merrill F. Unger says that three days and three nights might be understood to be only a portion of three. Only a portion of three. But what does the Bible say? What do we need to know from what the Bible says? What did Jesus say in the words that I just read to us from? Let's go back to it and look at it again. 
In my Bible, those words are in red, which that means that's what Jesus said, right? Okay. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How can we make all of that reconcile itself? Um, three days, three nights. Jesus didn't just say three days. He said three days, three nights. Uh, those that have stated, as I just give you the statements of, are those who just look at three days only and disregard, apparently, the nights. I was reading uh, another commentary. I've done a lot of reading and studying today in preparation for this and uh, renewing my mind and my understanding of it. And one of the commentators that I was reading after said, well, uh, the majority says that a portion of the three days, like I just talked about here, uh, is all that's important. But then he went on to say, but uh, it cannot be that way because Jesus said three nights. And that enters something else into the picture. So how do we, how do we make it speak to us uh, truthfully then in terms of what our Bible says. Well, to, to start the process of helping to uh, give you something to think about, I want to go back into the book of Genesis, to Genesis chapter 1, and I want you to look at something that is very familiar to you that you may uh, read and just kind of gloss over. Not that you mean to, it just doesn't jump out at you uh, sometimes. But it has jumped out to me uh, in the past, and it jumps out to me tonight. In Genesis chapter 1, we have the creative work of the Lord taking place. In verse 5, after the first day of creation, here's something interesting that I want you to note. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now that's pretty simple. We understand that, don't we? We know what that means. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. Look at verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So in God's uh, economy, this seems to suggest to me that day is not what you and I know as a day. Daylight and darkness, in God's economy, it's the reverse of that. It's darkness and daylight. You ever seen that in your Bible? You ever thought about that? All right, look, look again. At uh, verse 13, and the evening and the morning were the third day, on the third day of creation. You follow it right on through, verse 19, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day of creation. Uh, verse 23, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And verse 31 gives us the sixth day and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day the evening and the morning were the sixth day what is significant about the use of of that terminology in the bible well, we understand, of course, that it is used to speak of the 24 hours which make up a solar day. There's no question about that. We understand that to be the case. We understand that the word day is also used in the Bible to speak of significant days, like, for example, the Day of Atonement. That was a very important day uh, associated with the feast celebrations of the children of Israel. We know that in the Bible, a day is also used to speak of a period of time which can cover 
a few days or many days which God works in a particularly planned way in accord with his design and his will. Like, for example, what's the time that you and I are now living in as believers in Christ? What do we call this time period that we are living in? The day of grace. The day of grace. That's what we call it. It's referred to as the day of grace. And so there are many days, many years in this dispensation of the day of grace. In the text of Genesis 1, however, we find that it has to do with the creative day that God used to do his work. And each day speaks, of course, as we've noted, of a 24-hour period, just like you and I know a 24-hour period, except it speaks of it, as I said, a bit differently. The evening and the morning make up the day. So what that would mean to us then is that presumably the day would begin at sunset or around 6 p.m. 6 p.m. or around sunset. Now, let's go back to Merrill F. Unger. He says in his dictionary that the Jewish day was the period from sunset to sunset. The next uh, and the next day would begin. Sunset today to sunset tomorrow, that's one day. And that was God's creative day. We have scripture to back that up. God defined it with his institution of the day of atonement that I mentioned there just a moment ago. And here's what God had to say about the day of atonement in the book of Leviticus chapter 23 verse 32 as he gave this instruction to uh, Moses. He said, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, comma, even or from even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So from sunset to sunset, this celebration is to take place of the day of atonement. Not like what you and I do in terms of celebrating our day. Uh, note also that it was to be, that particular day was to be a Sabbath of rest. And that would say to us, as critical thinkers and students of the Word of God, that there are uh, additional Sabbaths that are given in the scriptures different from just the Sabbath that occurs on the seventh day of the week that was observed by Israel. There were Sabbaths of feast that were set up like the Day of Atonement and that was to be a Sabbath of rest. All of that becomes significant in understanding what day Jesus was born, uh, was uh, crucified on uh, in my way of thinking. As I said, and I repeat, I just want you to know, I haven't specifically gotten it all figured out after all these years, but I'm working on it, and I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to give me more enlightenment and more understanding as I continue to uh, strive to really finalize that answer in my mind. So all of this is very interesting. Now, with what I've just said, think about the text again. Uh, Matthew 12, verse 40. It specifically says that Jesus, as I said a few minutes ago, would be three days and three nights, both in the heart of the earth. Words spoken by the Lord Jesus himself. So is it possible that we could reconcile that terminology with what I've just talked about in some way? 
Now, I want you to know before I give this to you that I'm not telling you that this is accurate, right? I'm not telling you you can put this in your black book or red book and, and take it to the bank, but I'm going to tell you what I've come to know and what I've come to understand. I'm just going to share it with you, let you make up your own mind. How about that? Consider this logic in light of all that I've just told you concerning days, sunset to sunset, what Jesus had to say here in this passage. Think about this. Approximately 6 p.m. Thursday to 5.59 p.m. Friday would constitute day one, right? In addition to the fact it would constitute night one. Because the evening and the morning were the first day. The first 12 hours dealing with the nighttime, the second 12 hours with the daytime. 6 p.m. Friday to 5.59 p.m. Saturday would constitute day two. Does that make sense? 6 p.m. Saturday overnight into the first day of the week, the next morning, day three. You have three nights, three days, so that potentially we could say that Jesus arose, as the Bible says, the first day of the week, according to Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19, he arose very early that morning, the third day, and what I have just given you would be the third day. So that sometime after 6 p.m. Saturday, Jesus arose because when they came to the grave site early the next morning, they found the stone rolled away and they found the sepulcher empty. Matthew 28, 1 and Mark 16, 1 tells us that that in the end of the Sabbath they came, the Sabbath was passed, and I'll hopefully have time to give you more on that in just a minute. Thus we see the unity of the scripture through that process. I'm not telling you that's accurate. I'm just telling you that based on my studying of days and how they unfold in God's economy and so forth, it certainly sparks my interest. Uh, it really, really does. There's a third thing that I want you to consider in conjunction with all of this, and that is that uh, all of this has to do, in our celebration of Easter and so forth, has to do with the celebration of Jewish Passover. And you remember the institution of Passover back in the book of Exodus chapter 12 uh, where God told Moses to uh, have the children of Israel to pick out the, the, the little lamb, a lamb for a house, to set it aside for the Passover and for reasons known only to God. In verse 2 of Exodus chapter 12, God chose the month of April and we know that for a certain fact. God chose the month of April to be the month in which the Passover would occur. And he chose the specific day that it would occur. And you know what that date was? The 14th day of April. The Bible says the 14th day of the month Abib, A-B-I-B, -B, and that Abib was later changed to Nisan, as I pronounce it, N-I-S-A-N, -S but that was used later in the Old Testament scriptures. Both, both of those words are accurate words to describe the month of April that you and I celebrate in accord with our Julian calendar. Now, there are folks who get into uh, looking at calculations based on the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar, and there are different days and so forth associated with each of those approaches. We, of course, are more familiar with the, Jew, uh, the, the Julian calendar. 
And so the 14th day of April was the date of the uh, slaying of the Passover lamb. And Israel was to take that uh, blood, put it on uh, the lintel of the door and the two side posts. And then that night they were to uh, celebrate the feast and eat of the meat from the slaying of that lamb. And if there was any left over the next morning, they were to dispose of it and not eat of it. It all had to, uh, to, to be done in accord with God's time frame. So I know then that uh, the 14th day of April is the day that God said that the Passover lamb was to be slain. I know that that's exactly when it occurred uh, in its first institution with uh, Israel there uh, in Egypt before she was set free to leave that and uh, go forward uh, toward the land of promise. Now, because of that, I, I'm going to tell you that I personally believe myself I won't fall out with you if you have a differing opinion. I personally believe that Jesus died on April the 14th, about 3 p.m. in the afternoon of the year that he died. That's my personal conviction because he became your Passover and my Passover. And we know that God always does what he does with purpose. And when he instituted the Passover for Israel under the leadership of Moses back in her day of being in the land of Egypt, he did it with purpose. For it was typifying what was going to happen with his son long, long down the road in the future when he would die himself. But there are... Uh, commentators and so forth who talk about that and they say, well, there's, uh, there's issues with that. And some of the issues that they point to are uh, the fact that Jesus celebrated the Passover uh, with the institution of the Lord's Supper before his own death. And so, you know, some folks say, well, how could that be? That would mean then that uh, Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples in the upper room on the 14th of April, but died on the 15th of April, which would be the 15th day of Nisan, or Abib, 15th day of Nisan, which, by the way, is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All tying together right there. Um, so... When, when I think about this myself and, and I think of all that I have come to know and to understand through these years of study and so forth, it makes me in my mind wonder, I can't reconcile Friday as being the day that Jesus was crucified with what he said in his own words here in verse 40. Just can't. Um, the Roman Catholic Church has made sure and many other uh, churches down through the pages of time have made sure that that's how we devote our attention to the celebration of Easter and the crucifixion of the Lord. But is it accurate? I don't think so. I really don't think that it is accurate based on what I'm able to understand. So... What it seems to me is that Jesus was taken into custody and experienced all the things that I talked about on Sunday. And uh, on Thursday, about the ninth hour after being placed on that cross earlier that morning, darkness occurring from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, that uh, Jesus died about 3 p.m. on Thursday, the 14th of April in the year that he died. That seems to be the most likely thing that I can put together from my study of the Word of God because 
when his body was then taken down from the cross and planted in Joseph of Arimathea's newly hewn tomb, that would have been night one following over as I gave you the sequence a while ago, leading up to his resurrection on the first day of the week, early that morning before there were those who arrived at the, at the tomb. Now there's one issue that is entwined in all of that. Uh, and that's the issue of the day of preparation. For the Bible talks about the day of preparation. And the day of preparation was the day before the Sabbath. So if the Sabbath was on Saturday, and we know that it was the seventh day of the week, then that would have meant Friday was the day of preparation. And the Bible does speak of the fact of Jesus dying on the day of preparation. Now, you see where the confusion begins to come back in to the picture again. All right, let me enter something else for you to think about. Remember what I, I said about feast celebrations beginning with a Sabbath? And I can't tell you that I can answer this question now, but I can tell you what John says in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 31. Here's what he says. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, and this, of course, is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus and him crying on the cross in verse 30, it is finished, teteliestai, that I talked about Sunday morning. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Bible says then, John says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, you see the question that I put before you there? How, we, how do we reconcile that? That the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day. Uh-oh, something else new in the Bible. That Sabbath day was a high day. So what does that mean? Well, the Sabbath days that began... This is what I've come to understand. The Sabbath days that began the feast celebrations were considered to be high days. And that's why I took you back earlier to the passage of Scripture where God instituted the Day of Atonement to be the ninth day of the month. Therefore, on the ninth day of that particular month, whenever the ninth day fell, that was always going to be a Sabbath day. And it wasn't always a Saturday. Wow. Wow. It wasn't always a Saturday. So what if, now this is Joe thinking right here. What if they had two Sabbaths with the crucifixion of Christ? The 15th was a Sabbath. 15th Nisan was a Sabbath because it was the first day of the seven-day celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that was a Sabbath followed by the usual Sabbath on Saturday. I'm not saying that was the case. I'm saying what if? Then it all makes sense. It all comes together in my mind because that was a high day. Then they would have had their normal Sabbath. Certain things went on on that day. There was the preparation of spices and so forth. Um, and the actions of Herod took place on that particular day. The stone was put there. The guards were put in place to protect the tomb. There was a number of things that happened. But... Um, it's just interesting for me to think. So I'm, I'm thinking out loud and I'm sharing that thought process with you so that you can have something to think about and meditate upon as well. But the bottom line is no matter what position we might take or stake ourselves out with, here's the, here's the real truth. Everything that happened was foretold by the Lord Jesus. Amen? 
Peter absolutely proclaimed that everything happened just like it was supposed to happen whenever he preached to the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And Paul declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 8 that every bit of it was absolutely true. So it's all good, amen? It is all good. There's one other thing I'm going to give you and then I'm closing. And that is <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. I'd never seen this before until today. I've read it my entire life, but I've never seen this to understand it the way I now see it and understand it. Um, In verse 1 of chapter 28, Matthew leads off by saying, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to the sepulcher. In the end of the Sabbath. Beloved, the Sabbath officially ended when Jesus Christ arose from the dead. It officially ended. That's why Matthew said here, in the end of the Sabbath, it was the last one that would ever be recorded. The end of the Sabbath. The seventh day of the order of the law of Moses that Israel was to worship God. Worship then trans, uh, uh, or, or moved to the first day of the week, and we, re uh, we observed the first day of the week for our celebration. I've known that, of course, all my years, but we hear people sometimes who don't quite understand. That's why I point this out. They will sometimes pray on Sunday morning, Lord, we thank you so very much for this beautiful Sabbath day. It's not. It is not the Sabbath day. It's the Lord's day. It is the first day of the week. The Sabbath ended with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Matthew must have had that in view, maybe with even other things there in verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, all things had changed and all things had become new. I hope you've enjoyed the study. It's interesting to me, and I hope you've, I've given you something to think about. You may have your own thoughts about all of this as well. <clears throat> um, Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for the fact that we can study things like this that are not necessarily totally clear in our minds, but Father... Over the course of time, we pray that you will increase our understanding and our knowledge and help us to see more of what your wonderful word teaches us because you have so much there for us to know and to understand. And I love your word. I love you, Lord. I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit who leads and guides me as I study. We give you praise and honor now for all that you will do for us through the remainder of this Wonderful week of celebrating what you did for us at Calvary. This we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.